verification kit eh commercialized as Hafiz H A F I Z and the second one is new formulation of Fizzpit eh commercialized with a brand name Tohira eh As an academician he has frequently contributed eh to the scientific community through her role as a regular reviewer of manuscript submitted to international peer reviewed journals eh mostly the scientific journals on microbiology food science and uh, pengurusan uh, fakulti uh, Prof Ali Prof Su Dr Ros uh, Dr Jana Dr Wan Latin Katija and then kita ada Datuk Baka Datuk Yazid sebagai pengarah istihalal sekarang uh, keluarga saya isteri saya anak saya dan seterusnya para hadirin sekalian pada pagi ini uh, sebelum uh, saya mulakan uh, ceramah inaugural saya saya ingin mengimbas kembalilah kiranya seorang ataupun kita bercerita sedikit berkenaan dengan seorang yang sangat saya rasa uh, patut kita hargai dan juga sanjungi uh, beliau ini uh, adalah seorang yang mula-mula sekali mengasaskan Institut Pendidikan Perak Halal di UPM iaitu pada tahun 2006 dan beliau juga lah yang telah uh, menjemput saya untuk menyertai Institut Milik Perhal pada tahun 2006 dengan persetujuan daripada dekan kita pada masa itu iaitu Datin Katijah. Saya ucapkan terima kasih banyak-banyak. Uh, uh, beliau telah saya rasa membawalah uh, UPM, Institut Halal UPM dan juga Malaysia uh, kita kata ya uh, ke bekas takat kebangsaan dan juga antarabangsa berkenaan dengan perkembangan uh, halal ya uh, di dunia uh, dan beliau juga adalah saya kata macam saya punya uh, mentor lah dari segi penyelidikan perkara halal ini dan kiranya memberi kecayaan kepada saya untuk berada di situ menyumbang usaha tenaga kepakaran dan sebagainya uh, tetapi beliau kita kata ter, orang kata Allah lebih sayangkan beliau dan beliau telah meninggalkan kita pada jadi kita uh, untuk itu marilah kita sama-sama membacakan surah al-fatihah dan sedekahkan pahala kepada beliau al-fatihah Uh, Okey, uh, seterusnya izinkan saya uh, menyampaikan ceramah inaugural saya dalam bahasa Inggeris. Uh, the title of my inaugural lecture this morning is uh, Halal Food Authenticity. Does it matter to you? So, uh, I hope by the end of the lecture, you will be able to answer the question. But, I will not give you a mark. Only Allah will give you the mark for the answer, whether yes, no, or don't know, or you don't have any idea, and so on. Not me, yeah? Okay, before we move on, we move forward, uh, we look at this uh, a picture, yeah? Uh, uh, describing, basically, the demography of the Muslim population. So we can see that Muslim is almost present everywhere in the world yeah and about 2 billion of them and uh, as we all know that uh, nowadays uh, halal is become an important economy to the world and the business is worth trillions of us dollar yeah is is a huge market but uh, but we have to be you know really go to the ground and then check for the reality or we have to do a reality check we cannot simply uh, consider assume that this 3 billion is a uh, is ya yeah, good for the economy and so on but what happened to the actual thing that is happening on the ground so that's what actually my uh, research focus or uh, my subject matter of this uh, inaugural lecture and for those who have never attended any you know halal awareness lecture or courses consider this as one yeah so please because why i i said that because uh, 
you know that if you go to the supermarket, if you go to the shopping complex and so on, you can find all these uh, halal product label with different different halal logo, yeah. And but sometimes you don't know whether this halal logo is really authentic or still valid, and so on. Sometimes uh, people simply put halal logo, but the product has never uh, gone through any, you know. And if you go to the restaurant, also the same, yeah. Uh, we are not really sure nowadays, but the trend is many people eating outside, you know, for their lunch, for their dinner. And have you checked whether the restaurant has halal certificate or not? So those are the things that, that we have to take into consideration. We cannot simply say, oh, we have 2 billion Muslim population and the potential for the market is huge. And why don't we do it? Yeah, so that's the thing that we maybe I can share with you today. And... Uh, uh, before we, before I actually, uh, last, last week I communicate with uh, Prof. Raja uh, through WhatsApp and because uh, she's now in uh, Japan and cannot attend my inaugural lecture and she said, oh, I'm sorry, cannot attend your inaugural lecture, but uh, uh, maybe we can do something. I told her, why not if you can find any halal restaurant, but you can also find non-halal product or non I'm, I'm not saying that non-halal restaurant because we haven't done any verification and so on. As near as Sri Serdang, you know, Sri Kembangan, Bangi Putrajaya. So what does it mean? So it's really up to us, you know, to, to, to judge whether to go to this place or not by, you know, by having the knowledge, information. If you don't have any knowledge, any information, of course, we cannot do anything, or we cannot help you, yeah? So, because of maybe ignorance of the people and so on. So that's the thing that I would like to share with you. And also you notice that most of the product with the halal certificate, for example, not just from Malaysia, or not just in Malaysia, in other countries in the world, because, because when we talk about halal, even though the lecture is in UPM, but actually we are representing the basically people of the world because we are in Malaysia but we are also people of the world we are part of the world yeah so when you go when you go to overseas yeah so you will have to consider the same thing as what you are really uh, concentrating or focusing in Malaysia the other people outside also will have the same you know uh, the same expectation they expect that the product in Malaysia, you know, must be all halal because of the system that we have. The restaurant that they go must have logo Allah halal displayed clearly, for example. But nowadays, you see, when you go to the restaurant, very difficult to find the logo halal displayed. And we are not really sure whether the, the restaurant has halal certificate or not. Sometimes they have, but for whatever the reason, we also don't understand sometimes they didn't display. They don't display the halal logo. Why? What is the issue? Right? So that is very important for us, yeah. For example, huh? so that is the thing that I would like to share with you in the earlier part of my inaugural lecture. And uh, maybe, yeah, because of the busy activities, daily activities, you know, the focus is different. The children nowadays has their the different activities from what we have last time before. They busy with the whatever computer, internet, all those shopping complex, and so on. So, so sometimes they don't have really. Uh, uh, basic, strong, basic, fundamental of halal and so on. Yeah. So that's why I would like to share. If you are already familiar with this, just bear with me. And if you are not really familiar, maybe for Muslim, for non-Muslim, yeah, maybe you are not really familiar. So we can learn together. Yeah. Because this halal industry is not just for Muslim and also for non-Muslim. And the, the you know most of the factories, manufacturers, companies, you know that produce halal product. Yeah, some Muslim, some non-Muslim. So we uh, have to work together. So we have to understand the concept of halal, you know, as mentioned in Al-Quran, you know. So halal is permissible by law, by Sharia law. And, and when we talk about halal, especially when in relation to food, we have to always combine with toyiban concept. Or normally we call it halalan toyiban, yeah. Toyiban is good, wholesome, quality, safe, nutritious, and pure. Sometimes you have product labeled with halal, but it's not really healthy. That's what happening or 
that's what actually occurring in our system. You know, when you do shopping complex, the product that has halal, halal certificate mostly are what? Junk food. You know, highly processed food, which we don't eat that often and we don't eat that much. Yeah, but the, the restaurant, the whatever that we always eat for our lunch, our dinner, we don't really concern. So, a bit strange sometimes. If we think deeply, you know, a bit strange. So, that's, I think we have to really do something. And, uh, and this definition, actually, we, I obtained from uh, uh, what Malaysian standard. Malaysia has developed a Malaysian standard for halal. You know, halal food, production, preparation, handling and storage. General guideline by the Department of Standard Malaysia. We have the representative from from the DSM, Mr. Razif, which we are working very closely with us in UPM in IPPH. So, I think everyone in this hall should have this uh, standard. It's not that expensive, about 30, 40 ring, 20 ringgit, and they have the translation. If you are not comfortable with the English version, you can always have the Bahasa Melayu version. You know. So everyone of us must have this because why? Because in this book, it's not only mentioning the 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 ingredients, but also the process of producing halal food as well as the slaughtering. You know, and also mention about the halal, you know, uh, animal, haram animal, halal ingredient, haram ingredient, as well as the definition. Because and they already what we call it. Uh, translated, you know, uh, from the Al-Quran into this uh, simple version. So everybody can read and understand easily. So you don't have any problem, yeah? And especially for the, what, uh, food service operators, restaurant operators, you know, that provide food for Muslim, they must have this. If they don't have this, so how could they produce halal food without any guideline, any, you know, information. So that's the problem. That's the thing that's happening nowadays. So we have to be careful, yeah? And as mentioned, yeah, in Al Quran that uh, all your people eat of what is on earth, lawful and good. Lawful and good. So with this lawful and good, actually we put this halal logo at a very high standard, you know? And this standard can be, you know, used by other people because in other system, conventional system, in order to produce a food, you must have this GMP, GHP, and all those systems, you know. So basically all the system focusing on the uh, good, the good aspect of the food, but didn't touch on the halal. So if you have a halal certificate, halal toyiban, so you have like, you know, double assurance. Halal and good. The other, you know, group, only good, no halal. So your product has bigger market. For Muslim manufacturers or non-Muslim manufacturers, you have this halal certificate on your product. You have actually a bigger market as compared to if you have a product only good, yeah, without halal. So your product will be consumed by non-Muslim. Muslim cannot consume. So it's like you know, uh, add value to your product, not just good but also halal. For halal, you can cover the whole world market. Uh, for Muslim and non-Muslim and non-Muslim alike. And uh, as opposed to halal, we have to also know what is the opposite that we are talking about every day, you know, every time. And in the layman term, we call it haram. And sometimes haram word is not that, you know, acceptable by some people. They call it non-permissible. So you can, you can use either words, either non-permissible or haram. But if you want to emphasize on certain, certain problem and you want to you want people to rectify the problem then you can use haram so that they like a bit scared you know if you use non-permissible maybe they still you know take it lightly you don't they don't take it seriously yeah so haram basically is an arabic term means forbidden anything that is prohibited by sharia law actually halal and haram covers the whole thing, the whole aspect of human life for Muslim, yeah. But in my lecture, I'll be talking only halal, haram, related to food. Okay. Uh, so, for example, this uh, animal, we have to be what right frank here, yeah. This animal is haram, and all the other part derived from this animal also haram, according to our Mazhab Shafi'i, yeah. 
But certain mazhab, they said uh, some other thing. We are not really concerned about that because in Malaysia, we are practicing mazhab Shafi'i. Yeah? So there are a lot of things can be used, can be derived uh, from this animal. And right from the cosmetic, pharmaceutical, food, toiletries, even ammunition, you know, bullet, uh, glue, gum, stem, everything. Uh, you can use uh, some part of this animal to apply. So we have to really be uh, concerned about this. And there are also some other, not just this animal, there are some other animal that is not allowed in Islam that you can find actually in this book, in this standard. That's why I told you just now, this standard is very, very important. Because not just mentioning about this uh, uh, pig, but also some other animal that is not allowed and also slaughtering process, even though if you have the halal animal and if that animal is not slaughtered according to Sharia law, it's also not halal. So that's the thing, yeah? It's not that thick. Only how many pages? About 30, 40 pages. But explain everything that you need to produce halal food. Yeah? So please, uh, please if possible, get it quickly from DSM. <laughs> All right? Uh, and another aspect that we have to, you know, you, we have to know is the, you know, just now, halal and then haram. Next is Shubha is another thing that is concerning us a lot and sometimes give us headache, big headache, you know. Because why? As mentioned, as said by Prophet, uh, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what is halal is clear, mentioned in Al-Quran. What is haram also clear, mentioned in Al-Quran. But the problem is the thing that sit in between this halal and haram, which is called Shubha or Mashbuh. Yeah? And Prophet Muhammad Wasallam said that whoever distanced himself from it, from the Shubha Mashbuh thing, he has acquitted himself from blame. And those who fall into it, he has fallen into a state of haram. So the conclusion is that when it doubt, leave it out. Easier. If not, then you might you know, go into, in the end, haram things. But the problem is, this Shubha Masbuh thing is a lot, you know, if you really check, you know, observe, this Shubha Masbuh is a lot. If you are not careful enough, you can easily go into it, especially things that related to food. As I will give you an example here, yeah? Uh, this is a very classical example. I have a new example, you know, recent example, a lot of example, but you might not understand with that example because of the technology, you know, in terms of the production of food ingredient and so on, and in terms of the naming of the ingredient, you might not be understand, understood about that ingredient, but this is very classical. If I explain to you or tell you emulsifier E471, almost in this room know, know what is this emulsifier, right? Uh, very common, E471, almost present in all the processed, highly processed food. Yeah, and I'm not saying that this ingredient is not halal because there are uh, what uh, criteria you know to declare this halal or haram. For example, the sauce, the processing. Yeah. So I just mentioned to you, E471 is an emulsifier composed of uh, lipid uh, fat molecule which can be obtained from. This is the important aspect that you have to know. The emulsifier part. But it's okay, fine, no problem, yeah? But the source from either animal fat or plant oil. That's why I told you just now, I'm not saying that if we, we are not sure, this may be from plant, maybe from animal. So if animal from cow slaughtered according to Muslim, it's okay, no problem. But if from non-halal animal like pig and so on, it's not okay, haram. But the problem is, there are possibilities. If this emulsifier is not certified with halal, it's possibility, you know, like you have a 50-50 chance to get this from animal or plant. And there is no halal logo. And you know it already. By listening to my lecture today, now you have the knowledge. So if you look at the back of the label, you see E471, no halal certificate then, because you know already, and it's already doubt. So you have to leave it out. Right. So that is the thing. That, that sometimes we have to, we must have the knowledge in order to make 
like what we call informed decision. You must get the informed decision, even though the decision is made by yourself. You cannot simply make a decision without any prior information knowledge. Yeah. So this is the problem. So you have to really check E471 and also E472. Another classical example, but very critical one is gelatin. Yeah, gelatin, kan? You have E471, gelatin. Gelatin also the same as emulsifier, almost present in all product, especially highly processed. You just name it, fruit juice, jelly, ice cream, you know, cake, pastries, everything contain gelatin, contain emulsifier. Yeah? So gelatin is a translucent, colorless, brittle, flavorless, and can only be derived from animal. And many people confuse and make other people confused as well by defining you know, collagen differently. So the collagen must be obtained from animal. And animal, as I mentioned just now, can be, you know, and in fact, gelatin from uh, pig is the, the highest like, in terms of the amount, quantity. Because of the, the gelatin itself in the, this animal is high, and then the processing may be very eff efficient, effective, low cost, and so on. So you can, able, you can get gelatin from pig very easily as compared to other sources. And gelatin from pig comprises of maybe 90% of the, the whole uh, uh, gelatin market in the world. So 90%. Only halal 10%. And yet you can find this gelatin-based product in all of the products. Can. So, so that's the thing that you have to be careful, yeah? And why I give you an example of these two, because even uh, this is the gelatin powder plant. I told you just now, people tend to define gelatin wrongly, sometimes confusingly misleading the people because of the marketing, they want to sell. They know that, oh, gelatin from animal, subha, haram, and so on, yeah? And they they change the marketing strategy maybe to plant. There is no such thing of gelatin from plant. You know, because if you look at the chemical composition, structure, everything, even the definition already stated, stated clearly that gelatin must be obtained from collagen. Collagen only available in animal. But now you have this gelatin from plant. So it's already confusing there. And you have this, and without any halal logo, some more. So what do you expect? Totally out already, right? But this is available easily. You don't have to go to Japan to find this. <laughs> I told you just now in the early my early lecture, you can find this in Sri Serdang, Sri Kembangan, Bangi, and many more places around you. And maybe.
a report steadily reporting these issues, but at the same time, you have this omission and denial. So that's make us confused, right? So that's the thing that happening. So you, we have to really, as I told just now, go down and then do the reality check, yeah? And these are the issues uh, happening before, you know, before, there are so many, and, and for us here, uh, it's not our job to make a statement or whatever, no, we don't make any statement here, just share the example and the, the issues before, yeah? And, you know, uh, because of that problem, even M Mufti issue an advice to us. What Mufti says? Tara check must be conducted. If you have this, then tara check must be conducted. And in this uh, Mufti statement, actually there are two meanings. Yeah, two meanings. One is, if you have this problem, you cannot simply disclose or spread. Mufti said, you must do verification, check. Remember, the issue is not genuine. Yeah? Because we don't want to create problem in the industry. You buy one product, halal, suddenly you said non-halal, and it's spread all over the place. It's not good, Mufti said. You must do thorough verification check. And if the product is really halal, then okay, what is the problem? If not, then the authority will take action. You don't have the right to take any action. Yeah, Please, be careful. We have to do it step by step, following the regulation, act and regulation. Don't simply viral, you know, this product is not halal, manufactured by this a company is not halal. No, you have Mufti said, yes, we have to check the product thoroughly, but please do verification. That is the, the Mufti said. Don't take like only the title of the what Mufti said. Oh, check, tara. Uh, uh, tara check must be conducted. Uh, yeah, but this has two meaning there. Yeah? And also issues like, jangan beli sausage, ayam, drug is halal. Happening from time to time, even though we have a good system, we have the good awareness program and so on, but still this issue coming. That's why we have to always update, update our you know knowledge level of concern about this halal product. Yeah? And also alcohol, also another issue. Yeah, some product you know, especially the condiments. Yes, yeah? sauces, condiment like you eat uh, uh, f uh, food with sauce and so on. That sauce can contain alcohol can or cannot contain alcohol. So if the product contains alcohol, you have to check the amount of alcohol in that sauce and also the origin of that alcohol. Yeah? And for ja uh, according to Jakim, alcohol content for ingredient is less than 0.5%. You have to check. And in final product, cannot be more than 1%. Because we sometimes can avoid the presence of alcohol in product. They, they occur there, present there naturally, like fruit juice. You know, it's very common example. Uh, you you extract the juice from the fruit, you know, because we are not really sure. Like, that one we have to investigate. Maybe the fruit containing yeast and so on, yeah? So during the processing, fermentation will be happening and produce some alcohol. But normally the amount will be very low, less than 0.5%, 0.01%, something like that. But if the alcohol suddenly more than 1%, then we have to do something. Maybe they add something from outside into the product and then become alcoholic beverages and so on. Yeah? And also the jelly, I told just now, the gelatin, you have issue of gelatin. And the fraudulent, the cheating, mis misuse of the halal logo also still happening. For example, in this year case, you have 2016, just last year, you know, but still happening this problem. And in fact, this morning I checked, uh, still I can get this with the product, uh, label with halal, but halal Malaysia, but the logo is different from this, uh, from this halal, uh, from this halal logo lah. Uh, bit different. The, this uh, fraudulent cheating or misuse of the halal logo can be in many forms. Yeah, they can use the the real halal logo, but already expired. One thing, can. Sometimes they use uh, this halal logo without permission. Simply put. Sometimes they use different. They use halal logo Malaysia, but different shape, different color, not color lah, the shape, the apa -apa characteristic too. Kan? So that's the thing that we have to check. Yeah? Tipu halal logo, still occurring in 2016. Yeah? 
Even though I can say Malaysia has developed very good standard, very good standard, kan? But still, this issue is happening. And what more in other non-Muslim countries that don't have any standard and so on? So, what do you expect? Yeah. So we have to be careful. And for vaccine, uh, yes, uh, there are some some issues there for vaccine because some vaccine we don't have an alternative and so on. So the Majid Fatwa will issue different statement lah. Eh? So what I would like to give you all is like you know what we call here sharing is caring lah. So we share together it's because we are care of you, care of ourselves. Can you share with me because you care of me? I share with you because I care with of you. So that's the thing. Yeah. So now uh, let's just look at uh, some of the research finding that we conducted in our lab, especially in Halal lah, previously yeah, with our research group. Um, uh, we focus on the four major component lah. At the early part of the research, we focus on the four major component, DNA, large, gelatin, alcohol. And of course, in DNA work, we have to do it step by step. For example, in this paper, what we do is to develop the PCR system from the conventional to real-time PCR and then look at the sensitivity, specificity first, you know, the reliability of the primers and so on. So we, we managed to publish and after that we test the primer, the system, everything and we managed to get a very specific, you know, uh, primer probe, PCR optimization and so on by testing with the other animal, you know, we develop uh, primer probes for uh, pork, and then we test for pork, and then we manage to amplify, but not in other animals. So from there, we prove that the system is very specific. After that, we look at the sensitivity. This is common in the molecular biology when you do PCR, right? You develop the specificity and then sensitivity. Yes, we prove that our system is very uh, sensitive, can detect the porcine DNA as low as uh, 0.01 nanogram uh, in the PCR tube. So very uh, sensitive, and after that we move on to the application of the system that we developed to the actual sample outside there, commercial sample, and we managed to like detect lah some adulteration of uh, DNA in other meat product, yeah, as evident in this uh, research finding about. 3.7 to 7.4, about five to ten percent of the commercialized product sold in the market has gone through some kind of adulteration with uh, pork meat. Yeah, so that's the thing that we have to check from time to time. And of course, this finding will be already published, meaning that it's already shared to you. What you can do is just go to this uh, what Google Scholar or whatever Science Direct, yes. Type the halal DNA whatever you get this paper then you can read, so the information is available especially for the scientists. But for the public, of course, a bit difficult. But uh, we always share our finding with the what regulatory agencies like JAKIM, DSM, Jabatan Kimia. So we try to like disseminate the information to everybody, not just to scientific community, but as well as to the public. So that's what we do, and after that we move on because of the complexity of the food metric, yeah, DNA cannot be easily extracted from certain sample, especially the plant-based, you know, they have all those uh, PCR inhibitors, all the alkaloid, alkaloid, everything. So we have to really optimize, you know, in this case, we optimize the extraction method for gelatin because gelatin also a uh, hardy sample in terms of the DNA to be extracted. So we have to really optimize and we manage to optimize like, basically the the extraction from gelatin sample and we compare with the other research. This is just to give you a simple comparison. Now, of course, in the paper, you will get all the detail. Yeah? So we managed to get a good DNA la, from this uh, gelatin sample, a capsule sample especially, and comparable or even better than the previously reported. Yeah? As highlighted here, for sign, we managed to get 0 0.06. Uh, other research, uh, some not. La. For example, in this case, we have better than the research published previously reported. And here we have better than the other research. For bovine, also the same. So generally, we, we managed to improve la, the, the, the method already existing available in the literature. Yeah, that's the important thing. La. And after that, we, we do the real-time PCR and we managed to amplify the targeted 
animal species. Like for example, we target bovine, uh, we manage to amplify bovine. Target porcine, we manage to amplify porcine. So, so, and we publish, of course, all the data. And after that, we move on to LUT. After finishing with the DNA, you know, right from the optimization, standardization of the parameters, everything, check on the real sample, and then, actually, after that, we develop into the rapid method, which I will explain to you later, yeah? From the DNA, lab conventional, we move on to the rapid method. Already successful, and now we look at the LUT, another problematic lah. You can say kan, it's LUT. Uh, maybe LUT is used a lot in the production of emul emulsifier, uh, bread improver, and so on. Yeah, but it's not that easy to detect LUT because they have this like fame fatty acid metal ester composition, the same as other fat and oil kan. But somehow we manage to differentiate. Yeah, when we we do the experiment using uh, GC top MS. And then we analyze using uh, principal component analysis statistic. We manage to like differentiate, uh, produce a different group. If the fame is from light, is in this group. Uh, fame from another uh, fat, another group. So from here we know that oh, uh, based on this uh, experiment analysis, we can actually differentiate. But in this experiment, we only do for the separate sample. We don't mix, you know. Uh, we, we have lard, do analysis, we have uh, cow fat, chicken fat, different analysis, and then we, anal uh, we like do statistical analysis. Lah. But if we mix together, there will be a big problem. And we're still, still actually working on it lah, to really determine the animal species or the fat type if they are in mixture. You know? So still we are working on it. And then another Sample that concerning us a lot is the gelatin, I told you just now, right? And also, by using uh, analytical technique, we manage to differentiate lah, gelatin source. But maybe the differentiation is not that, uh, in the beginning, lah, it's not that conclusive. But somehow, we manage to start something lah, eh, before we move on to, to more complicated or conclusive experiment. So still, again, we manage to group a different uh, gelatin source uh, from different different animals. Yeah, this group for fat from lard, uh, from pig, bovine, chicken, and so on. So we managed to differentiate. And um, there are actually uh, uh, quite a number of methods that you can use. Uh, depending, sometimes the application will be depending on the complication or cause or. Uh, the sensitivity, yeah. but actually there are many, many methods that can be developed, many, many instrumentation that can be used to verify the, stat the status of halal product. It's just that we want to do it or not, that's all. Yeah. As uh, evident also in this uh, report that we also managed to, you know, uh, differentiate the plasma, blood plasma from different animals because blood plasma is also another uh, critical issue used a lot in the uh, meat, meat based product, you know, from fish, like when they develop through the surimi, they will add agent to, to, to improve the gelling properties. So that when you throw the, <laughs> this is a classic example, analogy by my maybe uh, lecturer, ko, Datuk Yazid, ke, kan? they always told me that a good fish ball is when you throw it onto the wall, it will return back to you. <laughs> I still remember, I forgot who's the uh, lecturer, maybe Prof. Yu or Prof. Jamila, you know? So it's good, uh, that fishball is good. If, the, if you throw onto the wall, the fishball stick on it, it's not good. <laughs> so how do they get that properties? By adding uh, blood plasma and so on. And this blood plasma is not halal. Yeah, all blood is not halal, cannot be consumed. So it's not, no way for you to discuss further. There's no chance for you, because if they eat blood plasma, that's it. Haram, kan? But we are not really sure whether, because the color is not red, the baseball is like good, white color, translucent, sometimes, kan? Because they extract the plasma, removing all the blood cell. That's why you don't have that red in color. So, but uh, our group, led by uh, Mr. Raja at the back there, managed to uh, detect lah, the presence of blood plasma in the product. Yeah, so we have quite a good research team la in the Halal Product Research Institute. 
to do all these tests. Yeah? And uh, so this is just to what highlight to you what we have done before in terms of this analysis authentication. So uh, we basically focus on these two aspects. First is the species differentiation, animal especially, because it's very critical. And also alcohol. Alcohol, we have to look at the, you know, because alcohol can come from synthetic, can come from natural, can come from fermentation process, can. So, can we, like, differentiate it? This alcohol is from natural. Because if you look at the chemical structure, it will look the same. Unless you go deep, look at maybe the isotope ratio of this carbon, uh, oxygen, hydrogen of that alcohol, then maybe you might be able to differentiate. And we are also in the process of doing that. Institute Halal has the facility, la, what we call IRMS, can, can do that. So they are really working very hard to do this experiment. La. And for the species differentiation, we basically established the DNA protein. Even DNA, we already come up with the kit, the technology to do rapid detection. For protein, you know, uh, they are working on it. Uh, they will develop this part we call biosensor, ELISA based biosensor, and so on. And fatty acids, not yet. Uh, not yet that reach that level. Uh, soon, I think, we'll reach that level. Lah, yeah? And this to share with you the rapid technology kit that we managed to produce and commercialize, what we call here Hafiz. Hafiz is stand for Halal Verification System. And this system is supposed to be lah, in the future uh, used to detect other, other components. Hafiz, Halal Verification System for porcine. Hafiz for lard, Hafiz for alcohol, and so on. So that's our planning in the future. Not just Hafiz for porcine DNA, no. Because we develop it as a system. But of course, the development of the system will be step by step, yeah? Uh, this is the step. Hafiz is very simple, you know. It's actually a real-time PCR-based platform, but it's portable, can be used by anybody, anywhere, and the process is very simple. You don't have to extract DNA. What you need to do is take the sample, put into the cartridge, run the machine, one hour you'll get the result. Very fast. And it's good for screening. Of course, you know, if you want to do confirmation, uh, if the result to be brought to the court and so on, you have to do it in the proper laboratory with the, with accredit with the accreditation, you know, certificate and so on. But at least it's good for screening. You can go this to the port, to the shop, to the factory, because we have done the test in I forgot, in one of the state, lah, eh? you know, to the restaurant. Okay, we come to test your... During the time, is the knife that used to cut the meat. It's only the knife. What is the problem? What is the issue? To cut the meat, but we are not really sure. Maybe now, maybe yesterday, they used this to cut pork. The next day, used to cut beef, for example. Yeah. So we go to the restaurant, and then, okay, we would like to test this knife. You know, you know what? What happened? The top management, the big boss, come down and then wait for one hour because very curious, you know, to see the result. Because it's a big restaurant. If something happened, got problem, then the business will be problematic, right? So the big boss himself come down and then wait for one hour just to see the result, whether positive or negative. And luckily, the result is negative. Then okay lah, kan? And then the boss will be happy. Otherwise, I will get heart attack. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you will get, I think, heart attack. So, that, up to that extent. So, if you really want to do it, you have the way to do it. If, but if you don't want to do it, then it's up to you lah, kan? So, that's the situation, yeah? So, and we managed to launch this product in, by, by the Prime Minister. During that time, Arwa is still alive in 2010. And now, the process is progressing. We, may, we managed to sell a few units of this machine and then we we'll license the technology market all over the world. So hopefully in the future, we'll see something yeah, out of it. And after that, we have also another group uh, developing biosensor. Uh, I have, uh, last time, a student from Unimap. We work together with the Unimap, with Prof. Uda. I don't know if you know Prof. Uda, Hashim. He's very famous professor in Unimap, developing biosensor. So we work together, and then we managed to get some preliminary results. And that result is, has, has the potential to be converted into the development of biosensor. And we managed also to collaborate with uh, one company that has the, that already has the platform for biosensor. It's very basic, but it's not in a proper 
packaging and has to be undergone like miniaturization to have a very small unit and also ongoing so hopefully by maybe yeah if you are if we, we are if we are really serious in that by next year i think we should, we should have this you know available but depending sometimes on the budget because from time to time we ask also funding we got rejected you know ask money from we don't get the grant so that's the limitation for us to move forward sometimes but okay it will not stop us from continuing the project and uh, just to share with you the because of the development the test method that we develop in the lab uh, after that we convert the method into the one that can get accreditation we do validation and so on and basically halal Product Institute offer lah from their development of the test method, validation, got the ISO certification, we offer the test to the public. For example, here is the test for porcine detection, detection of DNA, porcine DNA, another test method, and then amino acid profiling, definition of alcohol content. So they have this, uh, what service, services in Halal Institute. So what, they, what we need to do is just to receive the sample and do the analysis. And for the DNA, they have several, several process lah, ataupun actually each of the method called test method is very specific. You know, if you have a test method, if you have a sample, maybe meat based, even the method is using DNA, still called one test method. If you have uh, another sample like plant, develop the test, another test method. So they have several test method under DNA. Yeah, so you have this meat, real time PCR, and then we have Hafiz. The Hafiz technology, developed by UPM, you know, and we, from that technology, we developed the proper test method with specific food metric and so on, and then we apply for uh, MS-170-25 accreditation, and we managed to get that, and the test method is approved, la, is accredited for the Hafiz. So the process is like complete la, from the lab to the kit, and then used by the industry, by the public. So we managed to complete the cycle yeah, of that research. So what are the challenges that we are facing in developing all, all those, you know, technology, test method, kit, and so on? So basically, uh, and also the analysis. Why is the analysis in, is not uh, that popular, for example? Yeah? Why? Because industry wants faster halal certification process. It's like a pressure la, for the regulatory bodies, uh, enforcement agencies, or even JAKIM, yeah? because the industry keep on pushing. We want the halal certificate to be processed quickly. But at the same time, we, they have to do all the verification and sometimes need to be send the sample to the lab, can, will need some time to complete the test and so on. So those are, these are you know, some of the examples. And then consumer want cheap product. That's also another problem. The consumer, you yourself, uh, want to get halal food, but don't want to pay extra money, for example. It's not that, ex it's not that much, really, the extra. Maybe a few cent, a few ringgit, yeah? But in order to do that, they have to send to the lab. And when they send the sample to the lab, they have to pay the service. So when they pay the service, of course, we'll incur extra cost to the manufacturer. Then in the end, the product will be maybe higher than the one that has no you know, halal certificate or being done, being tested, you know. So those are the challenges. Complex analytical techniques. Because what I told you just now is the basic, you know. Because uh, the halal ingredient component can come from their uh, natural, like gelatin, lard is natural. Sometimes this natural will, go un will undergo modification changes, you know. So when they do chemical modification, they start to add some other side chain, this functional group and so on, then the detection become complicated. So those are the challenges that we are facing. And then you have undeclared ingredient and processing it. As I told you just now again, in the production of clarified fruit juice, they will not mention the process. Only the product, ingredient, nutrition content, that's all. If, so if you have, don't have the null, and if the product without halal logo, then you have to decide. Lah. If you don't have the knowledge, maybe you will buy. What's the problem? It's a fruit juice. It's an apple juice and orange juice. If you don't have the knowledge. But if you have the knowledge, then you know, oh, this process clarification use disease without halal logo somehow. So, doubtful. Yeah? So, better leave it out. And then you have a lack of biomarkers. Oil, protein, DNA. As I told you just now, kan, they're macam, the, sometimes they use original 
component. Sometimes they modify. So when they modify, we have problem. So those are the things that we have to consider lah when we do the analysis or develop the test method. Yeah. So this is another product that we managed to lah from all this experience in Halal Institute and then from our knowledge, expertise and so on. We try to like not try to solve the problem, not try to to find fault, because when we do analytical technique, do authentication, people will, will might assume that we are trying to find fault always, all the time finding other people fault and so on. So we are not comfortable also with that status lah. So what we want to do is, beside doing this authentication, we all we try to also provide solution. So if my ingredient non halal. So what is your solution? What is your recommendation? If you have the halal ingredient, then give, give it to us. So it's also our job, you know? If you know that this haram ingredient being used a lot, so we give solution, alternative to the manufacturer, to the people. Then they, uh, they will be happy, right? So we are not just finding fault all the time. So we give solution. That's what we are doing lah, currently. So we start with this animal feed and try to eliminate all the doubtful ingredient, you know, and then we monitor the process, make sure they are clean, tohir, uh, suci lah, tohir tu maksudnya suci kan. So those, the thing that we are in, uh, doing and we manage to commercialize and, you know, besides selling, selling, selling all the time, we also like give a complete package uh, to the farmers from, you know, uh, not just buying our product, but give them information, knowledge awareness program. For example, we start with the series one, kind of first series, give them halal awareness program. Uh, what happened if you uh, uh, give your fish, for example, this animal, bangkai animal ke, is it a lot or not? So according to uh, Fatwa Council, they said, if the fish is fit consistently with this uh, animal, bangkai animal and so on, the fish is haram. Even though, of course, when the fish eat, everything will be digested, you will not get any DNA picked in the fish, yeah? You will not get it. But consistently, because of the other issues, lah, maybe the, the Najis punya aspect and so on, the ethical, the values, the Islamic values and so on, they said, cannot, it's haram, yeah? Uh, the rest is okay. So that's the issue. So you have, that's why, that's the thing that we have to inform the farmers or even inform the consumers. So you don't have to worry. If the uh, fish feed with this, uh, the, this feed, commercial feed and so on, no, don't have to worry. But if the fish feed consistently with all that animal into the pond kind, all the time, then the fish is haram. Yeah? And of course, some other training uh, causes to the farmers, like how to reduce the cost, uh, and then how to compete with other big farmers, maybe aquaculture farmers in other countries, what are the strategies approach that you have to take in, into consideration. And then the disease, how to know the disease, the fish disease, how to treat the disease, how to prevent the disease, what are the management system that you must have in place. Like uh, the government already give, like develop what we call good aquaculture practice that you have to implement lah in order to produce safe fish. If you don't use this uh, guideline, good aquaculture practice, you might have problem of the, this disease and so on, and then your product might not be able to be to sell outside Malaysia, yeah? So, I think that's uh, the, the scientific part that I would like to share with you, as well as some background in the early part of my inaugural lecture. So, I hope you, you learn something and uh, maybe get benefit lah, from my lecture just now. So, next is I just would like to like make an acknowledgement lah, to the people that really uh, helping me in this uh, my research and the wars, academic uh, profession and so on. Uh, so first I would like to what thanks my parents, uh, my father and my mother, and then this is my, my wife, my daughter, there, and my, my younger sister, uh, especially to my father and father, lah, mother and father because of their hard work and perseverance, especially when they support me during my earlier education in school, in the university, right? So they are really my what role model lah, uh, because they are in apa, in my hometown. Uh, it's not that uh, easy the life there. Can they have to really work hard to earn the money and so on? So really appreciate them and try to emulate 
the good values too, much like hardworking, perseverant, and so on too. And also to my wife, which is uh, always with me, very loving, supportive, kan? <laughs> Uh, this is my wife, uh, and also to my uh, son and then my daughter, who always be being my what source of uh, inspiration lah. Because because of them, like we feel like to work harder to achieve more, you know. Because yeah, maybe because we feel that it's our responsibility to make sure that they are all, uh, you know, growing in a good environment and so on. So those are things that uh, really. Okay, next is the what uh, my students lah. Of course, yeah, because without them, I definitely cannot achieve whatever I I have now. Yeah, uh, my student too. Just example lah of them. Because I have a lot of student. Maybe my direct supervision. I was their main supervisors. Maybe or they are my uh, what I was the co supervisor for them. So there are a lot of them. Uh, quite but. Uh, I really appreciate the the effort, the help uh, to me, and also to this arwah that to Yakub lah. Uh, during my early time with Halal kan, for for I think six years, I was with him, and I learned a lot lah from him, from arwah that to Yakub ni kan. And she's very dedicated, you know. I still remember come to the office very early in the morning, and then go very late at night kan. So it's very hardworking. And sometimes he forgot about his lunch. Uh, sampai kan apa tu? Kak No always prepare the coffee for him, kan? Uh, and then, uh, kata very uh, hardworking lah. I think. And he won a lot of uh, award recognition from the uh, the UPM, the country, as well as uh, overseas, yeah. And Dr. Samsila also here. She's very helpful uh, for my project under InnoHub. You know, she also helped a lot actually to commercialize this Hafiz because that Hafiz technology is not that, you know, straightforward kind of thing lah. The commercialization process can we have to uh, do a lot of uh, <laughs> fighting lah, apa lah kan. So, but uh, Doctor Samsil me, uh, he sometimes arrange for the meeting with the minister, with the private companies, with Jakim, with Department of Standard kan. Even until now, she still helping me. So I really thanks to Dr. Samsila. And this is some of the students as two, as two, Adigamba. And then this is uh, I would like to also acknowledge my acknowledge my what counterpart lah in other countries yeah of uh, for example Thailand, uh, Thailand and Indonesia. This is the director of Halal Science Center Thailand. So we work very closely together and we share information, knowledge without any Orang kata limitation lah, and he's very you know good lah. He's very religious, and then he was the son of this group in Indonesia. They have this nah nadratul ulama dengan sapu ayat satu lagi. Tapi his father is we call Kiai Dahlan because nama dia Winai Dahlan kan. So his father is Kiai Dahlan is a famous religious figure in Indonesia. Okay, Kiai Dahlan, and this the Doctor Professor Doctor Anas Fauzi. He was the last time Vice Chancellor or Deputy Vice Chancellor of IPB Institute Pertanian Bogor, and they established the Halasan Center there. And we managed to communicate lah from time to time. We visit Indonesia, they come here discuss, and then we visit to Thailand with Cik Zulkifli Mat Hashim with me and Doctor Suami Napis, ah Suami Napis, Suami Abdul Rahman, you know, Suami Rahman. So I mean, Rahman is this the the earlier team, earlier team of halal lah masa tu kan? I think in 2018 something like that. And then I visiting what the Central Islamic Committee of Thailand, Sikot. We call it Sikot. Is the body like Jakim in Malaysia? So they handle all the religious Islamic religious affairs in Thailand. So Sikot, we visited them and then we communicate because they also. Interested during that time to develop the halal lab, you know, with the cooperation with Dr. Winai in Halal Science Center, and asking help from us in terms of the scientific technique because we are good in scientific technique, we are good in the research, they are good in the promotion marketing because Thailand is is good 
because they have all the even they claim themselves as the the kitchen of the world Thailand we don't have that maybe many products to be exported can all our product you know import the ingredient repack or remanufacture reproduce and then export and buy multinational company like Nestle they are not local brand right Nestle you make and so on but Thailand they really have the resources raw materials you know and they export the fruit they export the food they export the fish they export that's why they call themselves kitchen of the world uh, so Thailand is good in that uh, and I also giving a talk invited by this is Turkey you know because we used to have a roundtable discussion uh, among these uh, international halal certification bodies recognized by Jakim you know they are about 50 60s and they meet every year uh, and one of the meeting is always held in KL another meeting is they held in separate countries from time to time like they like rotate you know so sometimes in Turkey so we went to Turkey I, and I meet this uh, president of the one of the halal certification body in Turkey very famous popular very religious person you know Dr. Hussein Kami Buyukuza I'm I went there I think three times so and then I give a lecture in Kuwait you know this in Kuwait uh, they have the meeting of this certification body in Kuwait so invited me to give lecture mostly in this uh, development of the scientific technique so they don't have that you know because maybe of the support because they are all NGOs non-governmental organization it's so difficult to get support from the government but they're interested with this development of the technology uh, test method and this is authentication that's why they need our help so we went there give lecture and then I was in South Africa also uh, giving the same talk basically la, most of them are in the analysis and authentication and I was with the second director after Dr. Yaakob we have a second director Professor Dr. Rusli and with the third director of Halal Product Research Institute, Professor Dato uh, Yazid Cheikma, uh, uh, Professor Dato Yazid Abdul Manap, uh, and I have to really uh, thank him. And uh, just to share with you that I have a actually very special uh, relationship with Dato Yazid. Ni. <laughs> Dato Yazid was my uh, uh, supervisor for master and PhD, you know, even and then I continue the research group with him. You know, we went through the hard time together in research, in life. We stay in a hotel together <laughs> in Thailand. So I have gone through a lot of things together with that. We play golf together. <laughs> and, and he's very professional, you know. He's very professional and never stopped me from doing whatever I'm interested in. We have a quite a strong, strong dynamic group. I can call it strong dynamic group. Because why? Because... Uh, we have the freedom, even though I work with Datuk Yazid, but, but Datuk Yazid uh, gave me the freedom to work with anybody else, you know, and then come back with him, work with this group, that group. So it's really uh, what I really enjoy working with uh, Datuk Yazid. Even until now, I'm still working very closely with him. And even we plant, we plant trees together in his orchard. Until now, he told, always told me, Oh, it's me. Oh, you have a lot of and so uh, I, I always uh, remember lah, his uh, uh, apa, support to me and I will never forget that, Dr. Yazid, thank you very much. <laughs> and now I'm back to the faculty <laughs> with, the new, with the dean and I also must uh, thank the former biotechnology dean. For example, here present here, Dr. Baka, Datin Katija, after that, Prof. Hali, because they are very supportive. They never question me. When I was in halal, oh lah. Before that, I play golf with Dato Yazid. Before that, I play badminton with Dato uh, with Pro, uh, Pro Abakaria. <laughs> but he always smash me. You know, I don't know why. He always smash me. <laughs> when we are playing badminton, well, uh, but he's good. He's good in playing badminton because I, he has a good skill. Good skill. Uh, I don't have that skill. I I use always strength. You know, we, you know, we are young people. You know, always use strength. But he use the skill. That's why I always kenal ya. <laughs> kan. So those are the thing that I would like to share with you. And also, of course, last but not least, the Jatan Kuasa Sharahan Inaugural Faculty, led by Puan Su and. Uh, Che Razi and the staff of Biotech, you know, they are really working very hard. 
uh, and I'm very surprised uh, with that commitment, dedication to organize this inaugural lecture because they always ask me, Prof, and, but I sometimes cannot give the answer because very busy attending the meeting and so on. Kind. But they always do, do for me. So I just provide, uh, prepare the lecture and then bring the computer, that's all. The rest is done by them. So it's really, uh, I really thank you uh, to all of them. Yeah? And also the PSP, UPM, you know, Dr. Samsila, Mr. Zakir, Dr. Zahira, you know. They are really helpful, uh, always help me in commercializing my research output. And also the Penerbit UPM for printing the, I think, the inaugural book that you have in your hand now. And also Coscom for the marketing la, or for the promotion and for what, advertising my inaugural lecture today. I think that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Al Ustad, uh, Professor Dr. Suhaimi Mustafa, uh, for the enlightening presentation and interesting talk, and uh, giving us some information on halal, non halal, and also subha uh, in relation to, to food. Uh. So uh, instead of using haram, I think, in, in food, I think, maybe a more polite word uh, we can use uh, non halal, maybe. Yeah? and subaha. Eh? Uh, some halal food quite uh, clear. Eh? For example, peace ball, eh? made from peace and also not no, being put into the uh, example, if it is from uh, blood serum, eh? definitely it become non-halal. Eh? So in conclusion, I can say that the subject of this lecture is very crucial eh, for us as a Muslim as well as non-Muslim alike, eh, considering halal has become a global concern and play an important role in economy. Eh. I think uh, th this is quite clear lah, eh, whenever I uh, have uh, opportunity to travel abroad. Eh, many eh, friends, eh, uh, colleagues, eh, they may ask us eh, about this eh, halal and non-halal food. Eh. Okay, all products produced for the need of Muslim consumers must comply with Sharia requirement or in uh, simple word, we can say patuh Sharia lah. Eh? We can call patuh Sharia. Eh? However, halal food have sometimes found to be contaminated eh, with haram ingredient eh, because of uh, sharing facilities or maybe uh, the additions of uh, ingredients eh? and maybe also uh, due to method of processing. Eh? Uh, for example, when I was in UK long time ago, a eh? uh, Muslim community at that time asked me to list down eh? some of the halal and non-halal uh, food. Lah, eh? So, uh, very easy. For example, uh, table sugar eh? uh, came from sugar cane. Kan, eh? uh, I mean, if we look physically is is halal lah. Eh? When I call several companies how they process this uh, uh, sugar cane eh, to remove the brown color eh, pigment. Eh? Some eh, definitely they use activated carbon lah. Eh? Some company they use bone kan? Eh? Uh, charcoal eh, from uh, based from animal bone. Eh? Uh, some they may use uh, uh, charcoal from wood. Eh? Uh, so. I do not know whether <laughs> when they process through activated carbon eh, using both, this has to be made. Uh, eh? uh, therefore, eh, it is important to ensure that the authenticity of halal food eh, through analysis, eh, as already uh, presented by uh, Dr. Suhaimi, eh, using appropriate analytical technique. Eh? So there are rooms eh, where we can develop a new analytical technique and so on. And I believe method of processing also play very important role eh, uh, to produce uh, a truly halal eh, uh, product. Eh. Furthermore, food service operators should make sure that the food prepared for Muslim consumption is genuinely halal by using halal certified ingredient eh, and displaying halal logo and their premises eh, to avoid confusion and crisis. Eh. 
thanks to Professor Dr. Suhaimi Mustafa eh, for his quest for promoting authentic halal food for Muslim around the globe. Eh. I could understand that this is not going to be straightforward eh, as the development and innovations of new ingredients and processes in the food industry are advancing eh, very fast. Eh, I strongly believe eh, that Professor Dr. Suhaimi eh, could help to uphold and maintain the integrity of halal and drop shot dan sebagainya. Eh, dan minta maaf juga umur dah naik 56 tahun, eh, dia selalu ajak maintain jadi saya rasa Uh, saya patut bersara lah pada umur 56 tadi kan eh? Jadi bolehlah main benda lain lah kan eh? uh, Yang saya apa ada benda yang saya nak buat kecuali apa berkebun dan sebagainya Jadi ucapan terima kasih eh, dan tahniah eh, juga kepada jawatan kuasa penganjur eh, Jadi pihak fakulti dan penganjur atas segala kekurangan semasa majlis ni eh, Terutama sekali uh, ini kali pertama Haa uh, dipungusikan sendiri oleh dekan eh? biasanya oleh BC atau TNC lah eh? jadi agak gementar jugalah saya hari ini kan eh? jadi uh, jubah apa yang perlu saya pakai pun saya tak berapa pasti eh? jadi semalam baru tahulah jubah hijau ke jubah merah ke eh? uh, sebab kalau mewakili BC kena jubah hijau betul tak? Eh? Uh, jadi kalau sebagai dekan saja jubah ni lah tapi kalau nak pergi semayang nak jadi ustaz jubah pergi semayang lah kan uh. Jadi ada some confusion eh jadi mungkin apa ni majlis tidak begitu smooth eh walaupun semenjak saya jadi dekan uh, setahun lebih dah tiga inaugural lah eh yang yang terpaksa uh, bukan terpaksa lah yang saya telah handle kan eh? jadi terpaksa nanti kata tak jujur pula eh jadi dengan jujurnya memang saya apalah mantau eh jadi wabillahi taufik wal hidayah wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh eh terima kasih eh kepada semua yang dapat menghadirkan diri pada hari ini Majlis merakamkan jutaan terima kasih kepada yang berbahagia Profesor Dr Abakaria Arif di atas kesudian mempengerusikan majlis sebentar tadi Jutaan terima kasih juga diucapkan kepada Profesor Dr. Syuhaimi Mustafa atas syarahan inaugural beliau yang membuka minda. Seterusnya, majlis menjemput yang berbahagia Profesor Dr. Arbakarya Arif dan ahli pengurusan fakulti untuk bergambar bersama-sama dengan Profesor Dr. Syuhaimi Mustafa di atas pentas. Dipersilakan. <tuh> 